Hey, this is John Hall from Orleans, and you're listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages-friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil. It's fun, don't you agree? Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unted, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any pod catchers, like our Facebook page, or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and Bumper ending tonight's guest is John Hall of Orleans. Yeah, they, they had a big hit. Uh, Still the one. Still the one. Also former U.S. representative. Yeah. And he also has a new album out. What's it called? Uh, Reclaiming My Time. Yeah, excellent. It's stuff. got a wide variety of sound. Like, like It's got reggae, country, a little bit of rock. You know, Americana. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. So, hey, let's get to this interview. All right. Good night. Good night. John, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce to you my co-host, Jeff Unteed. John, this is going to be fun uh, to talk to you. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Eric. It's good to be here. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to do this with us. We're excited to have you tonight. But yeah. um, you've been extremely busy during the COVID-19 pandemic, recently releasing your sixth solo album, Reclaiming My Time. Can you talk more about the writing and recording process of this album? Sure. Um I I did some tracking up in New York State where I was living. Uh, you know, most of my adult life, I've been up in the Woodstock, New York area, or the Hudson Valley in general. Yes. And but I would record at home and just do, uh, uh, you know, do guitar and vocal and uh, percussion maybe, and then mm-hmm. uh, and then have uh, the other musicians record themselves at home. We did cut a few tracks down in, in Nashville with. Uh, my friend John Paul Daniel, who co-wrote uh, half, or a little, maybe a little, one more than half of the songs on the record um, with me, and uh, and we had different musicians. Uh, John Cowan, who uh, plays bass and sings with the Doobie Brothers, and was before that he was with the Newgrass Revival, recorded mm-hmm. himself singing and playing from his uh, home in uh, Colum- uh, Columbia, 
Tennessee. Uh, and uh, Jay Collins, who plays sax on uh, a couple of songs, uh, was up in Catskill, New York, his house. And, uh, you know, different people recording remotely. We've done the same thing with the Orleans tracks that we've recorded and had made videos of, videos of during this pandemic. Mm-hmm. And then we have a an audio engineer and a video engineer who put the pieces together and added them so they look like we're actually playing yeah. <laughs> uh, together in time with each other. I know, that's so cool. There's currently no software that lets you do that, that I'm aware of. We, we asked around with all the engineers we know and nobody was aware of that, but it'll probably happen any time because everybody's confronting that same problem. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we've spoke to many artists this past year, and they've spoke candidly about the creativity during the pandemic. You know, do you feel like the pandemic has inspired you creatively, uh, maybe to take a little more chances in the recording process for you, or is, how has it all worked for you? Well, it, it absolutely does inspire me. I mean, it's also uh, the fact that I haven't been on the road as heavily as we would usually be that's left time for more songwriting and more recording. We actually, uh, I think, had the same experience I did that many people have had, which is, I'm going to be so bored. What am I going to do staying yeah. home, <laughs> right. you know, locked down? And, and it turns out that every day I have a list of things I want to do, and I never get them all crossed off. Yeah. So so um, I never thought I would so be so busy not going out and doing things. Exactly, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's been interesting as there's a silver lining in almost any situation, I guess, you know, not if you're a victim of COVID, but, but for me, there has been. Oh, yeah. Very good. Well, I had read that you had uh, retired from touring back in like 2019 and then we're just getting ready to get it all started, started up again when the pandemic hit. Yeah. I had some health issues that uh, had to be addressed mm-hmm. and, um, and they are now I was, I was uh, just getting ready to rejoin the Orleans tour. Um, and, uh, and then the pandemic hit. So uh, we just started playing again. Uh, we all got vaccinated, of course. And um, first weekend in June, we started. We've been doing weekends since then. Um, we were just in uh, Indiana playing at the Indiana State Fair. Uh, nice. You know, before that, we were in um, Clearwater, Florida, and we played in Hiawassee, Georgia, and Oakville, Virginia. And, and Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and, yeah. and, uh, all over in Michigan. And, I mean, we just have been, we don't do a tour as like in a tour bus, the old, old fashioned way. We, we fly out and fly back and work mainly weekends. And it's been really fun. And the audience has been so happy to see and to hear live music again. I guess like on the practicality of things with the fly out date becoming the more common way of touring yeah. instead of you know getting on the bus and doing 30 40 50 60 days or whatever however it works for you um how is your how is your thought process touring doing the fly out thing on a friday saturday or a thursday friday saturday how's it how does it work for you and the rest of the band well we're used to it now so it works pretty well um there would it would be nice to have more continuity i mean i think that we all um that we all would like to be doing a steady diet of shows. But on the other hand, I, I just finished a, a video, the song lessons from my reclaiming my time CD. Mm-hmm. And that's just, we did a Facebook exclusive on that starting today for two weeks. And then it's going to go up on YouTube and all the other media. And, uh, and in the meanwhile, I'm working on another video yet after that, which is almost finished like 90% done for the song Save the Monarch. And these are things I wouldn't be able to do if I was on the road. Exactly. So it's actually, it's a mixed blessing, you know, and, and yeah. uh, uh, I don't, I'm actually kind of more interested in doing things that will last. I mean, one one show, it's great to do, and I don't want to, don't diminish the importance of performing live, but uh, so many more people can see you if you do an audio or video uh, recording, uh, the more people will see that by far than will ever see us live. Oh, very good. Yeah, can you can you talk a little bit about your uh, musical style? I mean, you're not just one genre. You're not you're not country or or reggae or or uh, 
you know, rock, you know, it, it's, but you, your music from what I've listened to so far kind of encom- encompasses a, a lot of a variety and, and it can be open to a lot of different people. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, well, I like a lot of different kinds of music and I think it was uh, Duke Ellington who said there are two kinds of music, good music and bad music. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, you know, in any genre, there's stuff that's good and stuff that I don't think is so good. But, um, but I've always enjoyed, I mean, I grew up playing folk music, first of all. Um, I grew up in Elmira, New York, where there wasn't a whole lot of a music scene going on. But um, <clears throat> I heard Pierce, Pete Seeger uh, with the with the Weavers, the band he was in uh, before he became known as a solo artist. Uh, my grandmother had his records and played them. And I also heard Chet Atkins mm-hmm. from her record collection and learned to play uh, This Land is Your Land from Pete Seeger and Glow Worm. <laughs> on the guitar from a Chet Atkins record, and, and and you know, and I listened to the Beach Boys and the Beatles, and I sang in choirs. I played organ in church. I did all. Kind of, my parents were into show tunes, Broadway show tunes, and into nice. uh, classical music. I studied eleven years of piano and six years of French horn. I just learned anything I could get my ears on, and uh, so you know we. We've always done, like with Orleans, we've done reggae and R&B stuff. We were started out being kind of a dance, uh, an upstate New York and New England college and club dance band and jam band. And uh, and then we moved more in a pop direction. But uh, but that was kind of, it's all just developed naturally. And when we first, uh, oh, geez, around well, the time we had our first album out, we were asked by... Um, Bob Marley and the Whalers to open to them at a place called nice. Paul's Mall in Boston yeah. Yeah. when the Whalers first came to the United States. And and one of the reasons was, uh, I guess the reason, was that we were one of the first American bands playing reggae. And they they heard that, heard about it. And uh, so we wound up, you know, opening to them. And we've done, we've done, uh, well, the name Orleans came from uh, the fact that when we started out, we didn't have enough original songs to fill up a whole night at a club. So we would do covers of uh, Alan Toussaint meters mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Neville yeah. brothers and New Orleans influence stuff. And um, so there's a lot, um, there's a lot of different styles that went into the band's makeup and went into my writing and, and production and arranging styles. Well, fantastic. You know, yeah. speaking of reggae, as I was uh, listening to the tracks for reclaiming my time, I listened to the you know listened to the new album a few times, but I kept coming back to World on Fire. Um, mm-hmm. I love the reggae vibe of that song. Can you talk more Thanks. about the, uh, the the writing, recording, and the just like, creation process of that song? Sure. Well, we started that song. John Paul Daniel, my my buddy and co-writer, um, had the idea for the chorus of World on Fire, and uh, it started out to be a, a song about spiritual enlightenment, enlightenment and growth, you know, and and communication, and then I said, we can't, this was a year and a half ago, when it was the mm-hmm. uh, the wildfires in and the bushfires in Australia mm-hmm. that were in the news, and we were seeing videos of these kangaroo hacks, like running to get away from the fire, from the flames, and, and it was so tragic, and then we started it then, and then the next thing you knew, it was the fires in California last, last year. Yeah. which was the worst fire season ever. Yes, but yeah. this year's fire season was looking to be still worse. Uh, so uh, I said to John Paul, we can't write a song called World on, World on Fire and not talk about uh, those fires. And it's it's, it's really... Uh, so the song is in the first verse that talks about uh, communication. Let's talk to each other if we still remember how. And... Um, you know, it's a picture of the Tower of Babel in the video. And if a, mm-hmm. a man and woman sitting on a, a couch, um, instead of talking, they're on, both on their cell phones. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, so it, it, the message goes from that. And it could be communication among couples or political parties or countries or, you know, any group of people that's not listening. They're just talking. And uh, and then in the second verse, it's, it's verse it, the lyric goes... Uh, uh, talk about hurling smoke and flame into the void. Talk about a thousand million creatures' lives destroyed. Talk about the air too thick with smoke and ash to breathe. Talk about destruction. 
it's too much too much to grieve mm. and you know that there's a term eco grief that um, a friend of mine actually uh talked about in the ted talk i think she made it up uh but it's uh you know the idea that we're all kind of witnessing this deterioration of the environment yes and the and climate change getting worse and and these fires and floods and and storms and uh it's hard not to be in somewhat of a state of grief about it mm. and especially if you have kids as i do or in my case i have a grandchild already and and i'm worrying about her and her generation you know yeah. and what we're leaving them so yeah the song is uh it's a serious lyric the the uh the recording it is is uh well john cowan sang and played bass on that and uh john paul daniel uh uh plays guitar with me on it and uh uh i played the uh the upbeat or the, the reggae style organ on that song and um uh, it's uh john paul um i'm sorry sean uh paddock who plays with kenny chesney played uh, drums on it mm -hmm. as he did on much of the record so mm -hmm. uh it was a really good um a really good band and a good recording and, but the story of that song is really the writing and and what was happening in the world at the mm -hmm. time that we were writing it. Oh, fantastic. Uh, it seems like the reggae sound comes pretty naturally to you. Could you ever see yourself doing a solo reggae album only, uh, that genre? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. It's a good idea, you know. But, I, but I'm always writing things like on this record, you know, I think of you as a straight ahead kind of pop yeah, thing. Yeah, I like that uh, uh, It's all up and down from here. I, I've always written, I mean, Dance With Me is probably... Dance with me and still the one are two best known songs that yeah. I've written. And my first wife and writing partner Johanna Hall and I wrote together. And um, you know, Dance with Me is uh, is a a folky acoustic kind of thing. I mean, it's it's got drums on it and and it's got the big three part harmonies on it. But it's <clears throat> it's basically an acoustic guitar grounded song. And uh, and still the one is somewhere between the Beach Boys and Chuck Berry. I, mm. You know, yeah. some people say Chuck Berry really started everything anyway. And, yeah, true. You know, yeah. there's been, been nothing original <laughs> since then in, in rock and roll anyway. But, but yeah, so I do a lot of different things. And I don't know if I, if it would feel natural to me to do an album of all one style, whether it's acoustic music or reggae or, or any one thing. Oh, yeah. Very good. Alone Too Long... Um, is another song that really caught my ear. It kind of gave me that 80s blues vibe. Yeah. Um, I love mm. the saxophone parts in that song. Can you talk more about the, crea the creativity of that song? Yeah. Uh, John Paul Daniel is uh, my co-writer on that as well. and He lost his wife. Uh, it'll be in September. It'll be two years mm. um, ago uh, to pancreatic cancer. Mm. And and I knew them both for 35 years and was driving down from New York to see them in Nashville and, and say goodbye to her. I knew she was in her last legs and and she died while I was driving down here. And, uh, mm. and so I, uh, but I was with John Paul for the uh, funeral and the, and the uh, visitation and all that stuff. And, and the night after her funeral, uh, we wrote the song Mystic Blue, which was the, uh, the third song on the record yeah but a long too long with after like eight months after she passed he asked another friend if it was okay for him to start dating again mm. and his friend said don't stay alone too long you might start to like it and i thought that's got to be a song <laughs> and yeah. and so uh, john paul was i think it was too close to to you know it was too close to where he was at at the time to work on it with me so i got tad richards from uh, lyricist from upstate new york to uh to finish the lyric with me and uh it wound up we started it right before the pandemic right before the lockdown happened and then it wound up being um becoming a song that was about what we're all going through what we've been going through in terms of uh you know look at yourself another evening with netflix mm -hmm, uh, yeah. microwave dinner for one you start to expect it anybody who's yeah. been alone i think for couples it's easier or families it's easier but if you're alone uh, during that time, which he was, and I was, um, you know, in my apartment up upstate and he was, uh, down here in Tennessee in his 
house. And, and so, it, uh, yeah, it took on that whole thing of, uh, of uh, you know, needing to be with other people. And, and so people relate to it for that. Yeah. Uh, the, the recording was, uh, um, we actually were able to do uh, the drummer, uh, Sean Paddock, John Paul playing bass and, and me playing um, uh, guitar in, in Sean's studio uh, in Nashville. And uh, <clears throat> so we were all being very careful about masking and isolating and all that. So we trusted each other and got together <clears throat> long enough to cut that. The, the three the three instruments bass drums guitar mm -hmm. and then everything else was overdubbed remotely and um but it turned out really well jay collins did his sax overdub on that from you know jay's been played with a lot of uh, wonderful artists he played with steely dan's yes. uh, yep. uh donald fagan and mike mcdonald and Bob skaggs as uh, you know dukes of september and he played with the allman brothers and he's just uh a very uh wonderful, incredibly creative, not just a sax player, but he, he can sing and play keyboards really well too. But he played sax on this and he did it from his home in Catskill, New York and just phoned it in sort of, you know, he just recorded himself and emailed the file to our engineer and the thing got put together like that. It was uh, nice. something you couldn't do without the technology that we have now. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, say what you will. But any song that's got vibrant sax on it, yeah. it just brings the song alive. Yeah, and it does. Kind of you know, I cool play a lot songs. of instruments. I, I, I play piano and French horn and, and uh, guitar, and I taught myself bass and drums and played. The first instrument I ever played in the band was drums when I was about 12, year old playing, 12 years old playing uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs. And, but, um, but I don't play sax. <laughs> and I've always wanted to play sax. So I love sax players and sax yeah. good sax solos and and uh i'm just really glad we got jay on that record oh it's fantastic yeah all right ahead, I, was, I was gonna ask you about the way back time machine and go back to uh kangaroo 1968 <laughs> um i discovered that one to uh, doing the research for this and man that was a cool album uh, there's a lot of uh, psychedelic rock in there heavy drums yeah. and bass we were very young yeah <laughs> I think some and, of our uh, listeners and inexperienced, but you know you got to start somewhere. Yeah, no, I think some of our listeners will be uh, oh. interested to go back and check that one out. You know, we uh, we played at the Cafe Wild in Greenwich Village um, as Kangaroo, uh, alternating sets with a bunch of different bands, and one of which was the Castiles, which was Bruce Springsteen's band when he was mm -hmm. about the same age. He was in New Jersey, and uh, you know the Jersey kids and Long Island kids would come into New York City uh, to this underage club where there was no alcohol served. It was just ice cream sodas and, and uh, potato chips. And, you know, it was uh, uh, junk food, basically. But um, but right before we had been there, Jimi Hendrix had played there. And oh, cool. uh, around the corner from uh, from the Cafe Watt, uh the Love and Spoonful had just had a hit with... Do you believe in magic? And they'd gone off on tour. And the band that replaced them was uh, the Flying Machine with the leader and rhythm guitar player and lead singer, James Taylor, and Bishop O'Brien uh, playing drums and Danny Korshmar, who you're probably aware of out there. He's uh, playing lead guitar in that band. And he went on to uh, to write a ton of songs and play with Carol Kang and, mm -hmm. and uh, produce and co-write The End of the Innocence of that whole album with Don, Hen Don Henley. And oh, I mean, fantastic. he's yeah. an unbelievable uh, writer, musician, producer, et cetera. And, you know, they were all in that band with James. And so, uh, and then after James uh, got his contract with the Beatles label, Apple Records, uh, the next band that followed them into the Night Owl around the corner from where we were playing was David Clayton Thomas and this horn band that wound up being Love, Blood, Sweat, and Tears oh, after a while. Yeah. And uh, it's just the kind of fertile environment that I was very lucky or, or blessed, I could say, to be a part of. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I was just going to ask a little bit about uh, uh, some of the songwriting on that um, on the album, The uh, Frog Gigging. 
Did you, did you have anything to do with well, that? Well, Andy Smart wrote that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Norman Smart. Curious. And uh, Barbara Keith wrote a few songs. I wrote a few songs, collaborated on a couple. Uh, Kangaroo did a big tour, <laughs> which we consisted of playing at the Cafe Wa five days a week, I think it was. And then one weekend we went out to Las Vegas and played at the MGM Records Convention. That record, uh, the Kangaroo record, came out on MGM. And then after that, we went to the Singer Bowl in uh, in New York out in uh, Long Island where the World's Fair had been held uh, went back when it was in New York City and played at this open-air revolving stage um, venue opening for the Doors and the Who. Oh, cool. Fantastic. And, and then back to the Cafe Wa. That was our tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three stops. But... um. But playing for the doors and in front of the doors and the who was an eye opener. Uh, we were so wet behind the ears, and uh, I borrowed guitar amps from everybody I knew who played at the Cafe Wa, and uh, hooked them all together, and it was still sounded like a gnat buzzing in your ear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> compared to the in an outdoor stadium with a revolving stage, compared to the uh, the wall of Marshall amplifiers or sun amplifiers that the the, the who had and the doors had, but. <laughs> But, you know, we made a good showing. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So uh, earlier you mentioned you were uh, uh, joining back with Orleans. Are, are you guys working on a new album? We just finished our very first Christmas record. Oh, cool. And it's going to be out in October. Uh, I had written a song called New Star Shining that was uh, originally when I wrote it. Our publishing company told us, uh, me and Johanna, they told us that we should write a song for Alabama's Christmas record. And we wrote it and then Alabama turned it down. But then mm. it was recorded by, as a duet by Ricky Skaggs and James Taylor. Nice. And, um, and so New Star Shining, you know, came out that version and they, they did a video of it and everything. And then uh, decades went by and we, we released it on a, an Orleans version of it on a record called Woodstock Christmas that came out in Japan only, but it was never, released in the rest of the world, uh, especially here. So that's the title track of this record of ours that'll be out in October. And the rest of the songs are uh, mostly original or, or songs that are obscure that we found from writers we know. Uh, okay. There's, It's not a collection of, you know, of Christmas carols reworked. Yeah. It's, it's mainly original stuff. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So uh, are you residing in Nashville now? I am, yeah. I'm just, I'm just moving actually from uh, from upstate New York to Nashville. I've, I've had a place in Nashville uh, for four years in the '80s and for a couple of years in the '90s, a couple more years in the 2000s, and I just, uh, it's for a musician and a songwriter, it's a really great place to live. I mean, I, I love, I still love upstate New York, and I, you know, grew up there and spent most of my adult life there. So I'll always go back for, for different things. But for now, it'll be natural, you know, looking forward. Very good. Yeah, this is not a not a musical question, but living in Nashville, uh, they got, a, I think, an IndyCar uh, street race coming up here. Are you, are you interested? Or do you watch racing? Or follow? Uh, not, not really, no. I mean, horse racing, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, Olympic uh, kayak racing, yes. Yeah, I watch that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I guess coming back to the uh, the Nashville end of things as far as residing there, we've had many artists that have uh, shared with us their pil pilgrimage to Nashville and then their uh, exile from Nashville. They exiled themselves. Yeah. And it's, it, they all give us like a different, you know, theory on, on, on living in Nashville. Some artists say it's so convoluted here. I had to go. I, I moved to Vegas instead because that's, you know, the rock <laughs> scenes. But, you know, what what is your thought process? Because it, it seems like. A lot of artists say, hey, we've, we've lived in Nashville for X amount of years. We're getting out of there because there's just no room for us any longer. How does it work for you? Well, it works very well, or I wouldn't be moving back here. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I, I have more friends here, really, than I have pretty much anywhere else, including upstate New York. And, and uh, because of my time over the decades spent here, uh, there, my publishing companies uh, are here, uh, you know, I, I'm a BMI writer. BMI is based here. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of reasons uh, to be here. There's good music 
any any night of the week if you want to go out and hear music yeah. and not just country music it's all kinds all kinds of music and and um so i uh it hasn't really been a problem for me that you know the music scene uh changes and the business i mean people ask me so how's the music business and i say well the music's fine the business i don't know uh, <laughs> because because it really is you know i mean there's um just like just like any place there are creative people that are that are doing good work and and uh but you know going back to when cassettes first came out people were saying oh cassettes are going to ruin the business yeah. nobody will buy a record anymore they'll be able to just copy cassettes for their friends and of course that didn't ruin ruin it and uh and then it was cds are going to ruin it. and then it was snapster is going to ruin it. and then it was you know streaming audio is going to ruin it and and um uh, and it's changed it and in some ways maybe you know hurt writers and musicians and bands but uh because they get paid by streaming services they get paid a fraction of what they would right. by an old-fashioned terrestrial radio station but it's still possible to make a record and to uh, have a career as lots of young artists have found out because they can nowadays anybody can make a record in their closet on an ipad or a mm -hmm. iphone you know and a computer and and so and put it out even and get it up on the uh, on the internet so you know it's good news and bad news but that's always been the case going back to i think when was it alexander graham bell who invented the you know recording on a foil cone mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh the mediums always change but uh but hopefully the music wins well as you say that i have one last question for you um on the state of the music business being what it is do you still believe that um, the tangible product will be the still, the, the, I guess, maybe the center hold of what music is all about? Because let's face yeah. it, uh, we're now we're album sales are not what they were. Now, now it's not even albums that are selling anymore. Now it's singles, and now it seems like we're going back in time with the back of, like in the '50s, where the 45 was the primary popular thing to have. How do you think it's going to work out? Do you think tangible music in your hand, going to the store and buying it or buying it offline, is going to come back to the popular culture again? I, that's a good question. You know, I mean, I like buying the records I really like, and the artists I really like. I'll buy a CD to have it, uh, uh, and I know a lot of people are buying vinyl. Vinyl actually just passed CDs in terms of the number of units uh, mm -hmm. sold in the last year or so, and. Um, but that's not because vinyl is selling so much. It's because CDs are selling less. Yeah, exactly. And, there's nowhere to uh, get them. Well, there's nowhere to get them except yeah. Amazon, you know, yeah. and or eBay. But uh, I mean, some places, some cities will have a uh, a real record store. But the the issue really, I think, is that everybody's going to be carrying everything around in their phone or their watch, you know, yeah. and um, and be able to listen on Bluetooth earbuds or something. It's it's not as social and experience i mean i remember you know uh listening you know having people over and listening to uh the beatles sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band album when it first came out and we would all get in a room together with a pair of speakers and try to get in the middle of the stereo field you know and yeah. and, and listen to it and it's not that kind of thing anymore but um uh, but it's uh as long as there's a way for artists or musicians to get compensated so they'll keep wanting to do it. I mean, you know, I didn't start out to make music to make money. I was starting out doing it as a kid because I loved it. Uh, but in order to get uh, well-developed acts and, and uh, songs and records out there, there has to be some kind of reward for them. And so exactly. as long as that's possible, yeah. whether it comes because you've got a jack in your temple and people plug right into it or or whether you've got a youtube uh connection in your brain yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean who knows what's going to come next but uh but i have no problem with people carrying my music around in a phone and listening to it or, or you know you can hear anything in your car if you can hook your phone up to it and uh so it's more important what it is and that people like it and how they listen to it oh yeah well said yeah. well um we're kind of out of our allotted time right now but is there anything that we did not cover tonight that you would like to plug or promote 
Well, yeah, I, if you want to find out more about uh, me or the Reclaiming My Time CD, uh, johnhallmusic.com is the website. And uh, we have a new video that just went up on um, uh, on Facebook for the song Lessons from uh, the CD Reclaiming My Time. And, uh, and that can be found, uh, well, if, you, if you're on Facebook and you look for John Hall Music, it'll be there. It'll be up shortly, uh, you know, after a couple weeks, it's going up on YouTube and every other platform in the world. But, um, you know, we're, we're making music. Orleans is about working on our 50th anniversary record. Hard to believe, but we'll be coming out with that in next uh, January because it was January 1972 when we did our first show yes. as Orleans. Yeah. We have a hard time believing that ourselves. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, just, you know, thanks for listening and, and thanks for spreading the word. Oh, very good. Yeah. Well, this is how it's going to work. We're about three weeks out, so this episode should be out in about, oh, after Jeff is editing it, done editing it, we're about, about three weeks. When it is, we'll okay. get it to your PR people immediately. Yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It was a pleasure. Okay, you too, Jeff. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.
If they ever take from you, then you plug out both their 